crazy. So like these big three, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, they manage $20 trillion worth of assets. And that $20 trillion, it's from a lot of the pension funds that you just mentioned, but it's also from a lot of the folks probably listening to this show. Like a lot of people don't realize that their 401k, either through their corporate employer or whoever else their, their invested retirement dollars, a lot of that probably goes to BlackRock funds or State Street funds or Vanguard funds. And that $20 trillion, that's more than the GDP of the entire United States. And those three companies, they are the single largest shareholder in 95% of the companies in the S&P 500, which is an index that tracks the 500 largest companies in the United States. You're listening to the Born Primitive Podcast. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Born Primitive Podcast. Morning, Tony. Morning, Bear. So today we got a good one, guys. Um, this is something that I've been kind of um, looking at for a long time and scratching my head. And um, the topic today is about woke capitalism and um, kind of what you're seeing in the corporate world. Um, I would call kind of an infection. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I have a very unique guest here. His name is Anson Frerichs. Um, he is a former president at Anheuser-Busch, which is relevant for what we're going to talk about, if you can read between the lines there. Um, prior to that, um, Anson was a, a Yale lacrosse player, um, graduated actually with my brother, um, and then got his MBA at Harvard, so he had to one-up us there. Um, he is the co-founder of Strive Asset Management. He, ac he actually founded it with uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, which is cool. Um, and basically, that's a multi-million dollar asset management firm that is committed to maximizing the shareholder value, you know, interests, not the stakeholder interests, which we'll get into. We'll, we'll just dissect that. Um, and um, he was also the founder of Athletic, uh, Athletic Capital. Um, and, and basically, Anson's going to walk us through what the heck is happening in the corporate world that we're all seeing. And it really kind of started around 2019 was, was a pivotal moment uh, in why you are seeing some of these companies take these um, very, I would say, far left positions that isn't um, – indicative of what I would say is the majority of public opinion in our country. Um, so, uh, Anson, welcome to the Born Print Podcast. No, thanks, Bear. Incredibly excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think, wild for a lot of people what they're seeing over the last couple of years. And they're saying, like, man, what is Bud Light doing getting involved with, you know, like transgender type influencers? That was never the Bud Light that I knew. What was Disney doing getting involved with, like, parental rights education? Like, talking about, should I teach kindergarten through third graders, you know, sex ed, yes or no. And people are wondering, like, how did that happen? Like, how do we get to this point where all of a sudden, like, it feels like corporations become political actors? So, you know, that's what we're going to talk about today. I think it's an important topic for people to understand. You know, a lot of times you just have to follow the money. And uh, so we'll go down that rabbit hole today and looking forward to the discussion. Yeah. So walk, take me back to 2019 and, and, and for the viewers and listeners, to, who is the big three? What happened in 2019? And how did that kind of catapult us into this insanity that we're seeing uh, right now? Yeah, definitely. So before I get to 2019, actually, like, let me go back, you know, kind of 30 years, 40 years before that, uh, which is an important time. It's really the 1970s. And there was a really debate that was happening in both the US and in Europe about what the purpose of a corporation is. Here in the United States, we had Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman, one of the best economists of all time. So the purpose of a corporation is to serve its shareholders. That's the primary obligation of a CEO and of a corporation. You serve your shareholders. How do you do that? You focus on your customers. You give them great products and services. So they'll buy more of those products and services, which allows you to hire more people, create more innovation, create more revenue. You know, that's how that's the, this upward cyclical cycle of how companies typically operate. And then that was in contrast. People have heard a lot about probably like the World Economic Forum, Davos, which is going on kind of next week. Well, that was started by this, this uh, Swiss economist named Klaus Schwab. And Klaus Schwab believed in not in shareholder capitalism, but this idea of stakeholder capitalism. And stakeholder capitalism said that corporations, they have to maximize the value for all stakeholders, not just shareholders, but that could also be political activists, that could be government organizations, that could be whatever, community members. It was never well defined, but they said that that's the purpose of a corporation. And if you take a look over the next sort of 40 years, we actually said this experiment that played out, like what was going to be better for both shareholders and investment returns and what's going to be better for societal outcomes. And I think it's like pretty clear. If you take a look at like the U.S., which has embodied this, this shareholder capitalism system from the 1970s till 2019, Investment returns were about 10% per year in sort of like broad-based equity markets in the U.S. You contrast that with Europe, which had about 7% per year returns. So that's like a 3% per year per difference 
which is thousands of percentage points over time. So over that time period, let's just say, Bear, that you had a $100,000 uh, 401k in the year 1970, 1971. 40 years later, you're looking to kind of cash that out. If you had it in the U.S. with that 10% compounded annually, that would be worth $4.5 million of a, of a 401k. Whereas if you had invested in Europe and European equities, it would only be worth one and one and a half million dollars. So, you know, that's a huge difference if you're trying to retire from an investment outcome. So like the shareholder capitalism model has worked very well from that standpoint. And then also like maybe the Europeans would say, OK, well, maybe we gave up investment returns, but maybe did we create a better society? Were there better societal outcomes? If you look at any broad based prosperity metric of the U.S. versus Europe, the U.S. trounced Europe over that time period. Look at our per capita income, trounces Europe. GDP growth, trounces Europe. Unemployment rates, trounces Europe. You look at things like interest rates, trounces Europe. You know, innovation, startups, like we just trounced Europe over the last 40 years. But it's interesting that in 2019, something important happened. There were some of the CEOs of the largest companies here in the US, plus three large asset management companies, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. They all got together. People like Larry Fink at BlackRock, Jamie Diamond at, uh, at JP Morgan got together with business leaders and at the behest of some European sovereign wealth funds that manage a lot of money, state of California, state of New York, that these large asset managers manage money on, they decided that you needed to, uh, to evolve the purpose of a corporation in the United States. That you needed to evolve it from one of folks on shareholder returns to stakeholder returns in 2019. And they did this because they saw the Trump administration. This was never an issue previously, but that the Trump administration had failed to solve these existential crises, you know, around so-called, you know, climate change, around racial, you know, racial disparity issues. And they called on corporations to now get involved in these issues that they had never gotten into beforehand. So that's kind of like the, the quick background. And by 2019, with this pivotal year, with this business roundtable initiative said, the purpose of a corporation in the U.S. is no longer to serve shareholders, but to serve stakeholders. And again, driven not really by a lot of people here in the U.S., but more kind of, say, coastal elites and a little bit like the European sovereign wealth funds. And you had said in the beginning, it's all about following the money. And it's just so, you know, kind of break this down to a little bit more basic level. You know, we talk about, you know, these pension funds, right? So for, for people that don't understand that, like you have the state of California, state of New York, those are the two biggest pension funds in the whole country. I think you said it makes about 30% of all pension funds, right? Um, you know, that's obviously these people's retirement accounts, right? So they, these pension funds have to give it to asset managers to invest over time. So they get compound interest and they're able to fulfill their obligation of the pension when that person retires, right? So it's critical. So the, the Gavin Newsom's and, and these other idiots in the world are holding these firms hostage of, Hey, if you want California, if you want to manage California's pension fund, you need to do X, Y, Z with the money, or you're not getting our money to manage. So, so these big three, of course, they have a, a financial incentive to, to play ball on these policies. And then same thing with the sovereign wealth funds in, in Europe. Um, so that's essentially, you know, these, uh, these com uh, countries are using the, their wealth to also invest in the same way to also get compound interest. So these European wackos are doing the same thing. Um, so essentially, the big three are doing it because they, they want to manage all this wealth and make more money on it. Um, so that's why they're abiding that's by the it. policies. Is that an accurate, uh, you know, kind of Fair, assessment? That's exactly. So I mean, you, you got it. What's crazy is like these big three, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, they manage $20 trillion worth of assets. And that $20 trillion, it's from a lot of the pension funds that you just mentioned. But it's also from a lot of the folks probably listening to this show. Like a lot of people don't realize that they're 401k either through their corporate employer or whoever else they're, they're invested in retirement dollars, a lot of that probably goes to BlackRock funds or State Street funds or Vanguard funds. And that $20 trillion, that's more than the GDP of the entire United States. And those three companies, they are the single largest shareholder in 95% of the companies in the S&P 500, which is an index that tracks the 500 largest companies in the United States. And with the money that they manage, they tend to control about 30 to 40% of the shares in most companies in the United States, which gives them outside control in terms of influencing management and how they want management to act, but it also gives them outside control in terms of how they vote shareholder proposals. And this is really interesting because shareholder proposals, anyone who owns $25,000 worth of a company's stock, they can put up a shareholder proposal. Now, most shareholder proposals is, just, you know, bear you or me putting one up, um, you know, they, they, they might not make it to the ballot, but since 2019, 
a lot of progressive organizations realize now this adoption of stakeholder capitalism and now companies, their purpose isn't just to serve shareholders, but it's the so-called serve all stakeholders. You're seeing a lot of activist organizations that are putting up proposals at companies. And you know, we'll probably get into this, you know, at Apple or at Microsoft or at Disney or at you know Exxon Chevron proposals that are not about the interest of shareholder value or what's best for the company and making more money, but it's about achieving some political aim. For example, there's organizations that deal with climate. They want ExxonMobil and Chevron, the largest oil and gas companies, literally just to stop producing oil, you know, which would literally put these companies out of business. It makes zero sense. And there's a lot of other examples that we'll get into, but this is what's problematic is when you have so much of the control of companies concentrated in three firms, and they can vote for a lot of these proposals that shareholders are putting up that's bad for, uh, you know, frankly, it's bad for capital markets, and it's bad for the society that we live in. And the people sitting on the board from the big three know that if they want to get voted back onto the board, they got to play ball with what the big three are telling them to vote on. So, you know, you got some guy who says, all right, I'm proposing uh, that you got to have tampons in the men's bathroom. Right. And it's like, okay, well, 40 percent of the board is from uh, BlackRock. So, yeah, that's a great proposal. Pass. You know, that's a silly one. Right. But these, you know, there's way bigger ones that are that are coming through that um, have a way bigger implication on the, the actual financials of it. Um, but is yeah, that a- but, but, but bigger, you're not that far off though, because I mean, there's a lot of people that are asking companies to apply on like abortion issues these days, because you know the Supreme Court they overturned Roe v. Wade. It's like people are putting up proposals, and you're right. Like if you don't play ball with kind of like the big three, they'll vote you off as a director, and they say you know you're not advancing what's called the environmental social governance, the ESG agenda that they are very prone that they're trying to advance in corporate America. And and where did Anson? Why did even the big three like? Of course, they too, when we keep saying follow the money, what was Trump that big of a catalyst to kind of force them and then even those 250 CEOs you mentioned at the beginning to start to perceive their their need to get involved in these issues? Or where did, why did the big three, what shifted their interest to to these political, environmental, all these different issues instead of like you said, just purely like, well, how is our product? How is our, uh, are, are we satisfying our consumer? Where does that stem from? Because there's where you start to hear like WEF and these different things that you mentioned um, earlier. Where, how did the big three, uh, you could use the word corru- get corrupted or become so leveraged in these interests that now it's obviously trickling down? Where does that stem from? Yeah, again, it's the, the, the plurality of a lot of the money they were managing was from like the state of California and the state of New York. And you have like governors and then you have a lot of mayors and others that manage pension funds in those in those states that they were trying to push back, frankly, against like the Trump administration. And what they couldn't get done through the front door of government, where like the individual people of this country and citizens that vote for laws, they saw it was a lot easier to actually go through the back door of corporate America. And because you could get, again, three large ass men, imagine if like three people in this country could control 30 to 40 percent of the vote of like any law that you that you would deal with. You know, and, and wherever, you know, you guys are living in Virginia or wherever else, but imagine it's like three people. I mean, this is like the stuff of like European monarchies in terms of like having like a small group of folks that would control that much power and that much influence. So it was a lot easier to start getting work done through this back door than it was through the, the front door of actual government. Because, you know, as you guys know, most citizens in this country, they don't want this like very forward, very progressive agenda, they especially when in corporate American, you know, that from my standpoint, um, when you take a look at sort of the voting behavior of the big three, I'm like, we'll just get into numbers. In 2019, there was, you know, we talked about the environmental social governance proposals. That's the whole category of shareholder proposals that ask for oil and gas companies to produce less oil and gas, that ask companies like Apple to do racial equity audits to figure out how they're going to, to um, you know, solve historic racism and, and white supremacy in the United States. There are certain proposals that ask uh, companies to defund the police and defund the military initiatives. Before 2019, there were maybe like, you know, a couple hundred of these a year that would pop up and they would pass with less than, I mean, less than 5% of these would pass because people said, guys, this is nothing about, you know, shareholder value. This is a political aim. We are voting against this and this makes no sense. After 2019, there was not only an explosion of proposals where all of a sudden you had six, seven, 800 proposals that shareholders were putting up at companies, but they were passing at rates of 40 and 50%. Because BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard started pushing these. And, you know, we can get into specifics here in just a little bit. But, like, that's, you know, how all of a sudden you saw, you know, a lot of these 
these these progressive organizations, they were able to get done again through the back door of corporations, but they weren't able to get done through the front door of government. It's a lot to unpack, man. I, I got a few examples I want to run through, but obviously the 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 elephant in the room. All right, so you were a president at Anheuser Busch. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Bud Light has been the number one beer on planet Earth for like however many years. Anheuser Busch is obviously an absolute monster. Um, and you had some genius who came in probably with a Harvard degree. I like to make fun of Harvard on the show um, and uh, said, oh, we, we need to expand our consumer base. We're the number one beer on the planet Earth, but, you know, we don't we don't have enough market share. So we need to expand it and align with a kind of transgender. I mean, it, it's a man pretending to be a woman. So I, I don't even know how you would classify that. And obviously the, the limited edition can and she did the, the Instagram post and the whole thing and it blew up. So just unpack that, walk us through it. What the hell happened w with Bud Light? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Bear, like before, maybe even like before I, I get in the whole Bud Light issue, um, you know, I'd like to probably like talk a little bit about like Anheuser-Busch and, and what I was doing with them for 11 years. Cause you know, I wasn't at Anheuser-Busch when that happened. But I think the critical to the story, I had experiences when I was at Anheuser-Busch and even saw the company change. Like when I first joined Anheuser-Busch um, at a business school in 2011, Man, right in terms of the company's 10 principles, it was like a meritocracy. They would talk about one of the principles, like we hire the best, we want you to recruit the best, and we want people to recruit people better than themselves, you know, at the organization. And then by the time that I left in uh, early 2022, they had changed that principle from being about a meritocracy to you get judged based off the diversity of your team. And so that now became like the leading card. And of course, like diversity, it wasn't just like diversity of thought, but it was, of course, like the diversity had to be based off like the immutable characteristics that, you know, people are born with. It's like, you know, did you have the right sex and the right gender? And, you know, did you have the right race on the team? That's what was starting to develop at the, at the corporation. And that's, uh, I think, like indicative of like some of the changes that I saw. So, you know, when Anheuser-Busch became like the poster child of this, of this, you know, call it the backlash against companies getting involved in political and social issues. You know, probably wasn't like totally surprised that they went down this uh, this this track. And you know, if you need to take a look at Anheuser Busch, like go back to 2019 because that's like this pivotal year. 2019, Anheuser Busch had one shareholder report, and it said, "Hey, we have one shareholder report, 100 pages long. This is how we add value. This is how we create value." But by 2022, they actually had two annual. Reports. There was one was a shareholder report and two, they had an ESG report that was 130 pages long that talked about their environmental social governance goals and everything that they're going to achieve as a, as a corporation. And one of those things they were proudly talking about was is that how they have a 100% score for like the human rights coalition, which judges how well you do promoting, you know, LGBTQ plus, 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 you know, initiatives. And they were kind of sold by the BlackRock, State Streets, and Vanguards of the world that like, hey, if you want to increase shareholder value, like, man, you need 100% scores on these like, you know, human rights coalition, you know, scores. And, you know, you guys need to be working with the World Economic Forum on, you know, kind of more of a globalist agenda. And, hey, you guys need to be working to figure out how you're going to decrease all of your like emissions on trucks. And, you know, like, I mean, all this like silly, silly stuff that has like nothing to do with actually just like producing like cold beer that consumers want to drink. So like, you know, you go back to like that set up, I would say like that was the kindling for this like absolute firestorm that happened when all of a sudden you have like a new brand manager at Bud Light that says like, okay, well, I got to keep these like high corporate equality index scores. And I got to like make sure that I have a hundred percent and I have to make sure that as Anheuser-Busch wants me to increase our diversity, equity, inclusion scores. I got a you know, whole story about this. Now, like, how do I do that? Okay. Well, Bud Light, which Bud Light had always been like, it was the biggest beer brand in the United States because it was remarkably apolitical. It was like a funny, humorous brand that if you look at consumer research reports, Democrats and Republicans equally enjoyed and equally drank. It like, you know, never got involved in political type things. And so like now all of a sudden, like you have this new brand manager that comes in and in her mind, she has like, you know, increase Anheuser-Busch's ESG scores, diversity, equity, inclusion scores, everything else. How do I do that? Oh, I know, I'm gonna take like the biggest brand that was funny, humorous, everyone loved. And now all of a sudden, like, I'm going to try to like start sponsoring, I mean, like really small percentage groups that are frankly like very controversial, you know, in this country, like the whole like trans movement is incredibly controversial. You know, it's like, you know, Bear, I mean, it's crazy to say like, you know, you're a college linebacker in football, 
But like in the world we live in, like if you decide to identify as a woman, like you could theoretically like, you know, gone out and start competing in like, you know, women's boxing or women's sports or whatever else. But like, that's the world we're living in. Like that stuff is controversial, like doing gender affirmation care for kids under the age of 18, like very controversial in the US. So why would Anheuser Bush decide to like put on the face of their can, like somebody who's incredibly controversial that like speaks to that agenda, that's kind of the face of that agenda, was at like, you know, the Biden White House a couple months earlier pushing that agenda, doesn't make any sense. Like it has nothing to do with shareholder value. And obviously like that's exactly what happened. Cause you had like, man, Anheuser Bush lost millions of consumers. They lost billions of dollars of shareholder value all in the name of trying to advance this ESG and DEI agenda. And it had nothing to do with shareholder value. And at the end of the day, it's been bad for the company because they'd have to lay off hundreds of people. Um, and, you know, they still lost 30, 40% of their sales at this point. It's, yeah, go ahead, Tom. In, 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 in your time there, because you, 2019, it sounds like, was kind of a catalyst year for a lot of this rollout. And then, Anson, correct me if I'm wrong, you left in 2022, correct? I did. I left did in 2022. And, um, you know, like, I mean, just quickly, like one of the big reasons for that is, you know, I saw Anheuser Bush was obviously changing as an organization. I mentioned, you know, it wasn't as meritocratic as it used to be. There was too much of an over indexation on sort of like the ESG and some of the DEI initiatives. But then I was looking around at broader corporate America as well. I was living in Atlanta, Georgia at the at the time. I was, you know, President Anheuser Bush, with, you know, COVID time period, I'm living in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, if folks remember, this was um, in 2021. This is like a crazy thing that happened. But there was like the Georgia Voting Rights Initiative that happened in 2021. And this is where the citizens of Georgia, everyday folks in Georgia, you know, in a Democratic election, they elect, uh, they elect representatives that put in a law in place that says you need to have an ID to vote. And that didn't seem that wild to me that, you know, there's 30 some odd states that say you need to have an ID to vote. It seems like it makes a lot of sense. But what was like absolutely insane to me that one was one of the first companies that stood up and pushed back on this law and said, this is bad for democracy. The people were wrong. We're going to work to overturn this was BlackRock. BlackRock was one of the very first companies, you know, large asset management company came out and said, this is wrong. We're going to push back on it. And we expect other companies to push back on it as well, because of course they're the largest shareholder. A lot of companies all of a sudden were listening. And this is where you have like Coca-Cola who hadn't said anything, hadn't said do about this. All of a sudden they're against this, you know, this law that requires just tonight to vote Delta airlines, you know, headquartered in Atlanta, they're against this. And what was even like wild to me was Major League Baseball had an all-star game that was scheduled in Atlanta that summer of 21. And all of a sudden, Major League Baseball cancels an all-star game over this law. And that like absolutely hit me at the core because when I was at Anheuser Bush, we were big sponsors of that all-star game. And like we had invested a lot of money into it. We were going to blow it out in Atlanta that year. And then all of a sudden, Major League Baseball, like, you know, not only is slap in the face, they're moving it from Atlanta where I'm living, but they move it to Coors Field in Denver. <laughs> And I sold zero beer at Coors Field in Denver. And like, even like wild, I think like, you know, Colorado has, you know, I, I think at the time, like, you know, they, they had like similar laws to, to Jordan. It literally made like zero, zero sense, this whole move. And what I like, what I noticed though, is that, you know, I had a lot of people that were like similar to myself, you know, like good credit score, you know, type folks, net saver type, you know, type folks. And all of a sudden, like, I saw them like throwing out Coca-Cola and I saw them canceling Delta tickets and canceling Major League Baseball tickets. Because they were like, this is nuts. You know, like, guys, I just want these companies to focus on their mission. I want Coca-Cola to give me great soda. I want, you know, airlines to fly me to the right place at the right time. I want to go to a good baseball game. Like, I don't want the politics to come with this. This is nuts. Like, this is not like the America that I want, where all of a sudden you get to have like BlackRock, you know, with Coca-Cola and others, like this small group of CEOs that are all of a sudden deciding, you know, for millions of people across the state of Georgia, the rules they should live by. It makes zero sense whatsoever. So, yeah, I, I I think with the, this is probably a, probably another topic, Tony. Maybe we can even make this one. But when you, you when you kind of unpack a little bit of the, the it's almost like gaslighting everyone into thinking that this ID law was somehow racist, and and, and it was so coordinated. Right, we're gonna tell everyone it's racist. We're going to make sure CNN talks about it and tells everyone it's racist. All the Democratic people in Congress are going to are going to be act furious. It's like so coordinated that they're pulling the strings and making this to happen. And it's like, all right, are we actually saying that because someone has to show an ID to vote that that's racist? So what we're actually so what you're actually saying is that you don't think a black person has the ability to obtain a, a freaking ID that's the racist part. Like that's, I, I, you know, obviously if, if I was an African-American person, and I saw that and I was like, I, I would be like, wait a second, 
you're implying now that I don't have the ability to bring an ID to the ballot. Like, are you kidding me? Like that to me, what are, like, I, it's like, like what? It's, it's so insane. And, and like, what is the basis for that? Particularly when it's like literally, okay, you got to show an ID to buy a case of beer or to get on an airplane. Like, why is that not racist? Are we now saying to buy a case of beers racist? Like where, you know, it, it's that, so, it, it's, it's probably so, coming beer. It's only a matter of time. It's so you know? ridiculous. It is so ridiculous that you almost can't even like, it, it, you don't even know if it's satire at, at this point, when you watch the news, you don't even know what's satire or real anymore. It's that insane. Um, so this is, this was, this is, I remember this example cause I became so furious and then Delta, the CEO, and now, you know, to, to, to kind of weave another part of this is like, you, I think you, in, in the statistics of the article you wrote, it said something like that, you know, 78% of CEOs uh, that, that are in the S&P 500 or whatever, their, their uh, compensation is directly tied to their ESG score, right? Um, and so there you go. Do you think the CEO of Delta actually thought someone showing an ID uh, at the at the voters box is racist? No, but he's trying to get that compensation, right? So he writes the memo, oh, Delta is against this and we might move our hub and Coca-Cola follow suit. They're doing it so they get paid because they know Daddy BlackRock is cutting the check, right? And and, and, the, and the board is deciding their compensation. So again, follow the money. Um, and yeah. it, you know, there was, uh, I saw, I think it was one of the materials you sent over. It was a CEO addressing like the top executives and he straight up said, I mean, this was on like a recorded Zoom call that I am holding all of you accountable to like who you hire and you have to check all these boxes, you know what they are. And if you don't, straight up your compensation will be adversely affected right and it was like so blatant it's it's like that right there is blatant sexism and racism like I, you know what i mean and I, I think we can unpack that in another podcast because i think you know that's just we could we could go long on that but it's just so crazy that we were all getting freaking gaslit into thinking that all of a sudden now if you show a vote an idea to vote that that it's somehow racist and everyone followed suit you know cnn was all over it and no one actually like you know most people you know, they're sheep. They just follow. Okay. I guess, yeah, it is racist. Yeah. I'm against that. And it's like, no, do you even know what they're talking about? So thank you for unpacking that a well, little bit more. And Anson, that's where I, I was curious in those three years, like 2019, when things started getting rolled out and then 2022, when you decided to leave the company, just out of personal curiosity, what was the vibe amongst other like executives in the sense of like, Hey, this thing start to get rolled out. Did you find the majority were like you were, you kind of like, hey, what's going on here? Or was it kind of an acceptance? Because I think what Bear was touching on is a lot of things like get rolled out and they pull on your heartstrings that on the surface, they're viewed as these altruistic, very like, hey, if you don't believe this, you're you're evil, you're a bad person. So were people, were people accepting of these things at the highest level of Anheuser? Or did you sense that like, no, a lot of people were asking questions and were curious, like what the hell has happened over these last three years? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, initially, because a lot of these called like ESG, Environmental Social Governance, DEI initiatives, they started rolling out in 2019, 2020. Obviously, like, you know, with COVID, there was the George Floyd issue that happened. Like, you almost couldn't question these policies when they were rolled out in 2020 and 2021. And I think like a lot of people, even though when you were at a corporation, they had concerns. They're like, man, what's going on? Like, you know, why do I have to take a, a you know, class at my company that tells me about like my white privilege that I have? Or like, man, I'll never forget, like when I was at Anna's Bush, this was in 2020 or 2021, we had to like go through like a whole day where they had like, you know, a transgendered person who was like on and they were talking about like, you know, what it's like to be transgender. And this is like, you know, forced training that you were supposed to do. And you're sitting here being like, man, like I'm at like Anna's Bush. I'm here to like sell beer. Like why like do I like why all of a sudden like am I getting these like forced trainings where I have to hear about like my white privilege and I have to you know, hear about like all my like, you know, biases that I have. And I have to like, you know, hear like a whole, you know, hour or two of my day about like transgender type issues. Like, but the thing was like the, I, there's like the Overton window because it's more like the Overton window of like what you can socially discuss and what you can't socially discuss. Mm -hmm. Like at that time, like the Overton window was like kind of closed. You know, like, like at corporate America, if you spoke up, it was immediately like, oh, this guy is, you know, at the time is like, you know, whatever, they're racist, they're bigoted, they're, you know, you name it, whatever thing. They're not aligned with the company culture and it can put your career at risk and your job at risk. And luckily, I think because of, you know, some of the work that we've done, not only at Strive, but a lot of other people as well have started to raise their hand. And, you know, we always say that, you know, fear is contagious, but courage is contagious too. 
And when people start raising your hand and you start speaking up and saying like, guys, what's going on? Like, you know, is this really about like shareholder value? You know, we're here to sell beer. Like, is this creating the right culture, the right incentives, the right way we're spending time? Man, you know, courage is contagious as well. And a lot of people now have started to raise their hands, speak up. And you're starting to see like a lot of like the pushback and blowback to these issues of ESG and DEI that two years ago you couldn't really discuss. And, and I think for me, it all comes down to, you know, they, they, they try to say, okay, if you're against that, then, you know, you're again, like you're a bigot or this and that. And it's like, I think what most of us want at the end of the day is society to based on be based on merit and, and, you know, it's exactly what it should be, but also like we, it's creating division. Right. And we want unity. Right. So that it's, it's like, what's the, what's the end state if we continue to do this? And like, you know, if you're an executive and in in a big director level position opens up and you are going to be compensated based on your ESG score, and there is a perfectly qualified candidate that is maybe a guy that looks like you or me. And then there's a, female, uh, you know, of a certain race, whatever, that's also, um, you know, homosexual, this and that. And they're both very qualified candidates, right? Who's getting that job? Guarantee option B, because that guy is then going to be, whoever hired her is going to be like, you know what? That just, I checked like eight boxes there. It improves my score at my end of year bonus in December. I'm going to get a bet. You know what I mean? So it's creating, um, you know, these it, we're, we're, it's it's not merit based anymore, right? And and I just don't no, think that's not. The, that's not the spirit of America. And, and again, where, where they where they gaslight us all is they say, okay, bear, well, you're against lesbians, then, right? You know, you you just said it. Look, listen to what you just said. It's like, no, that's not it at all. I actually, you know, when it comes to sexual orientation, I have I don't care at all. And I think that's why people like me get so mad. It's because like, guys, we don't actually care about skin color, gender, any of these other things. You guys are like basically gaslighting us into saying that we're against it, but we're not we are against hiring based on these things because that inherently is sexism and racism so like you're you're gaslighting us into telling us what that is and it's not you guys are the ones implementing those practices and that's why i get so fired up because most of us are just good you know common people man that you know just want to love our neighbor and be a good dude and you know just and treat people with respect and it's like you you don't give a damn about skin color or you know any of these things anymore i don't i think i genuinely believe and maybe i'm living in um, a world that, you know, maybe I'm delusional. I I think we're past that, man. So the fact that all these people still try to jam it down our throats, it's like, guys, we're past it. Let's move on. Let's come together because we're more united than we think. But then when they do shit like this, if you're the guy that didn't get the job and you see the candidate that you missed out on and you know maybe you were better than her, do you think that's probably going to create some resentment in that guy's heart for maybe years to come? You know what I mean? That, that that's a, probably a normal, reasonable response by that individual. So over time, yeah. what that actually will create real resentment in our society and potentially real racism and real sexism because then there's going to be the eye roll every time someone gets a job of like, oh, I wonder why, right? I mean, that's yeah, real. Come on, let's be real about it. That freaking happens. One one hundred percent bear yeah. that it happens. And the other thing about it is like, you know, frankly, like it's blatantly, it's illegal as well. I mean, the civil rights acts and civil rights laws say you cannot discriminate someone based off race, sex, skin color, et cetera. And that goes both ways. So like if you're putting quota systems in place and somebody's getting a job because they you know sleep with a certain someone or they're, you know, born with, you know, a certain skin color, or a certain gender, well, that's illegal. And like if someone else is losing a job over that, that's wrong. And what's interesting is like even what happened last year. When you looked at affirmative action, when you look at the cases against Harvard and against Harvard, it said Harvard can no longer discriminate against qualified Asian candidates, white candidates, other candidates like that is wrong. And when even affirmative action was put in place, they said, guys, at some point, this has to go away. This is not a permanent solution. And they decided, like, it's been long enough, you know, and that you have to go away. We have to start looking forward. We can't start squabbling over, you know, who's the biggest victim based off some immutable characteristic that you're born with, because then it's just a race to the bottom. That doesn't make any sense. We got to start looking forward, hiring off merit. That's what's good. That's what made this country, you know, great. That's gonna what's gonna make this, you know, country like great moving forward is hiring off merit. But I think too, that's why I mean Vivek, who you have a personal relationship with and also co-founded your asset management company, like that's why he's resonating, is because finally there are starting to be voices at the highest level who aren't playing this game. And when you hear them talk, it's like, I mean, you you pulled up a clip the other day where it's like Finally, he finally, yeah, by reporter. That was awesome. And if you talk to him, tell him that was freaking awesome. 
please. Yeah, no, uh, he's just so yeah. so articulate. He fit like it's a very clear. There's no, there's no. He's not on one end of the spectrum or the other. It's just very reason based. That like, hey, I'm not. I'm choosing not to play your game and do not ask me a dumb question like that yeah. because I see where you're going. Yeah. It's like I think more and more the when when momentum's a an amazing thing and as that builds momentum, like we we're, we're seeing it already. We're like a lot of these challenges games that are being played are are hopefully and maybe i'm delusional optimistic are going to fall by the wayside because people at the highest level are refusing to play it yeah yeah definitely i mean it's kind of like crazy and if you go like two three years ago like people just forgot about just like basic common sense like basic american values that like hey man like in this country like the american dream is alive and well for people like work hard get results get stuff done you know, this is not a country of victims. Like this has never been a country of victims. Like U.S. has been a country of underdogs, like since the beginning. And like, that's the way we need to think about ourselves. And, you know, we got to, yeah, overcome some tough odds. Yeah, sure. Everyone's born with certain hardships, but, you know, you just got to like work hard and overcome those things. Reminding people like capitalism is like the greatest system known to mankind to raise people out of poverty. It's not socialism. It's not communism. It's capitalism. Like we, you know, those are some things that people kind of forgot. And that's one of the reasons we co-founded Strive is like revive a lot of those ideals. And then obviously like Vivek, where there was a lot of resonance with what we were doing. And he was able to um, use that as kind of a springboard and bring that message to a much bigger audience. Yeah. And I think the, the, the optimism I have is that I think we're past the time of that kind of you outline a time period where you're like for a couple of years, like if you said anything about any of this, it was like, oh, dang, like, dude, don't say that in public. Like, but even though we were all thinking it in our living rooms. Right. But I think we're to the point now it's gotten so absurd that more regular people are starting to just be like, all right, guys, like, I don't care if you label me as X, Y, Z, like this is completely insane and we're going to talk about it. And I'd say, Tony, we're an example of that in this podcast. Like two years ago, we want to touch this with a 10 foot pole. Right. But it's like, okay, are we going to actually stand for something and be a brand that's about like some just common sense shit? Or are we going to be like all these other corporations that are checking all these boxes and say, look at this? You know what I mean? Like we're past that. So hopefully more dominoes will fall. And we, we definitely aren't the first. It's not like we're these pioneers. I mean, we, we you know, there's so many people that have kind of um, initiated that. Um, but, you know, I think a, another point of optimism is the consumer is starting to have a say. Um, there, I, th I would area there, I would argue there's some areas that like, we're never going to have a say, like we're, we're never going to influence Apple. Like I would say, like they have a monopoly. Like I don't care if Apple does some outrageous thing. Like I'm still buying the iPhone. Like just, you got me Apple. You know what I mean? Uh, Facebook and Instagram, you know, I know they're trying to roll out like truth social and all that, but like they have a monopoly. They can censor anyone they want. They can push all this propaganda. The election's coming around in November. That Meta, it will be absolute insanity on that platform. And you know what I mean? They're going to be blacklisting all these people that are that are Republican and all this. We can't. There's nothing we can do about that. Guess what? I'm still probably going to scroll Instagram, right? It's, it's gonna, but there's a couple. T there's a, there's a few areas in my opinion we have a say. Guess what? There's plenty of beer options out there, right? So Bud Light, you want to pull some shit like that? Guess what? Not never buying Bud Light ever again, right? Um, hey, Target. You want to put a bunch of women's swimsuits with tuck friendly flaps with a tag that says that. Um, so, you know what I mean? And, and OK, you want to play that game? Don't need to shop at Target. Right. So and I'm seeing all these like kind of conservative moms that are like, OK, you know, Roger that. And they lost, what, 10 billion in their enterprise value in like, what, a month or something like that? You know better than I would. Um, yeah. Same thing with Disney. And that's I would say I'm on the fence with that one because I got a you know daughter that's about to be three like. We're still going to go to Disney. Dude. Like it's going to happen. So, but you know, there are some people that are are like, you know what? We're not going to Disney anymore. Um, and it's like just the dumb crap that we, you know, they're. Doing. I've I heard someone that worked there told a friend of mine that they're not allowed to stay. Uh, you know, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, before a big show anymore. They have to say good evening to our esteemed guests because they realized saying a ladies and gentlemen was now controversial, right? That assumed a gender identity. Like that's the crazy shit that's getting pushed down there. Um, but so it, it's awesome that we're able to, when, when there is alternative choices, those are, th there's a significant opportunity for the consumer to make an impact. And, you know, that is also yep. when it comes to strive asset management with you, it be in which, you know, you know, we were talking about this off air, but okay, guys, if you have your money, in, you have Vanguard, your money in Vanguard, I have my vet money in Vanguard, you know, a bunch of my mutual friends and stuff. It's like, okay, I can shift all of that to you guys and I'm now not funding the problem anymore. So I think it's brilliant what you guys have done. Um, so if you're listening and wondering, okay, what can we do to change this? Con continue to be a consumer that stands for brands and companies that align with your values. Um, and it, when it comes to your money management, I mean, I'll give you the, the floor for this, Anson, but like, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can easily shift over from a Vanguard 
literally in two seconds and you have the same type of, uh, you know, kind of asset management structure on there and you're going to get the same returns and it's focused on shareholder value, not stakeholder value. Is that, that accurate? Yeah, Bear, I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, we tried to make this as simple as possible for people. And we saw this, we saw what was really happening when BlackRock was influencing all of these companies and getting them to adopt progressive ideals. For us, that was a fiduciary breach of duty. Because if you're managing someone's money, you have to act in their best interest. And that interest is, it's not a financial interest. But that's also, how do you want, because when you own a stock, you own a share, like you're an owner of that business. So you get to vote proxy statements. You get to have a say in how the company uh, and how the company runs itself. So when BlackRock is all of a sudden selling telling oil and gas companies to stop producing oil and gas or telling Disney to get involved in parental rights issues in Florida or Coca-Cola and voting rights issues, well, if they're managing your money and you don't agree with that, that's a fiduciary breach. And so therefore, we decided to create a competitor to BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard called Strive. And the whole point of Strive was our mission was to maximize returns for our shareholders by just focusing companies on excellence be excellent at what you do, create excellent products and services, period. That's it. We think that's going to make folks more money. We think that's going to be better for society because like, you know, let all these other societal issues work themselves out through like sort of the democratic processes that we have. So we went out, we raised um, initial capital from folks like, like uh, Bill Ackman, Peter Thiel, Founders Fund to capitalize a new asset management company. And we went out and we replicated the exact same funds that you can get from BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard. So large cap value, large cap dividend, large cap growth, energy funds, semiconductor funds. And we differentiate ourselves. We have the you know, same fees as those guys. But we differentiate ourselves about how we're actually voting proxies and how we're engaging with corporate America. And we've had a lot of success so far engaging with a lot of CEOs and then also bring our vote to the table. And you can start seeing, and I almost pegged when Strive launched uh, officially in May of 2022, that's when you started to see the pendulum started to swing back. And all of a sudden, you know, people starting to see of like, you know what, maybe these guys have a point. And I think most importantly, we talked about courageousness. Most importantly, we need to get back to like open debate and free speech in this country. That people need to be able to just have open debate and free speech and have differences on ideas and let the best ideas win. And it's so funny that what was a very contrarian idea two years ago, that companies were not going to be able to be a master to all these stakeholders, was now like a very mainstream opinion. Because people have seen they've lost tons of money with Bud Light. They've lost tons of money with Disney. And one of the reasons that you know a lot of those companies have been impacted, um, and even BlackRock, they've lost billions of dollars of shareholder value. You know, there's two reasons that like consumers will like really shift and make permanent shifts. One, when there's easily accessible substitute brands. And to your point earlier, there's like not a real easy substitute for the iPhone or for Instagram. There's just not. And then two is when they feel like they're having an impact of them switching is impacting the other business. And so if you think about like, you know, what we've done at Strive, Strive, it's like very easy to change because people can just move their money over to us, same funds, same fees, same everything else. And you're seeing in the press, BlackRock, all their ESG funds losing billions of dollars, BlackRock losing billions of dollars from states like Florida and Texas and Louisiana and other places. So like we're benefiting a lot from that. But then even with like Bud Light, same thing. Why, why was the Bud Light uh, impact so great because everywhere you can buy Bud Light, you can buy Coors Light, Miller Light, same pack, same price, yep. same everything else. And every single week, consumers are feeling the impact because it's being reported every week. Sales down 30%, sales down 30%. Think of all like the photos you saw on like Instagram over the summer, like nobody in the Bud Light line at a concert, yep. you know? And so therefore, like those are the companies that will be disproportionately impacted. Um, I, you know, I agree with you, like, you know, some people are still going to go to Disney World, but even Disney, like a lot of people canceled Disney Plus or like maybe they used to go to Disney World once a year or, you know, twice a year. Now they're only going once or maybe they're not buying like, you know, going to the Disney movies. Like, a lot of Disney movies have flopped this year. A lot of consumers, like, they actually are walking away from Disney to a large degree because they're like, man, I just don't like the pandering and I just don't like the, the the being inauthentic to like what your mission is, which would be just an entertainment company. It seems like they're trying to like push more of like a social agenda than anything else. Yeah, and I think eventually I think the chickens are going to come home to roost here because, you know, if you take it at, at some point, you know, while Gavin Newsom loves to invest his money in BlackRock, you know, for the pension fund of California, if those returns start going down, well, guess what? Those California workers that, you know, worked their whole life and were depending on this pension at the end of their, you know, 40 or 50 years at a company, whatever they did, if they're starting to get what you said, what, 70 cents on the dollar for what they might, you know, what they should get, well, eventually that's a decision you're going to have to make where it's like, okay, do we need to deliver on, you know, on, on the behalf of these, you know, middle-class people that, you know, worked their whole life to have a retirement 
or, you know, what's, what's the, what's the bigger, you know, issue here? You know, are you, do you still want to invest in, in these, uh, big three that are going to potentially lose billions of dollars if, if the tides start to shift? And if there's real alternatives like strive and you got everyday people like me that say, all right, I'll pull my, whatever, you know, whatever the mount is out of Vanguard and throw it right into strive. I'll do that today. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. If the dominoes start to fall on that, and particularly if you start getting the real wealthy kind of, uh, you know, conservative America to do that, and you get the billionaires to start to do that, that will be noticeable on the stat sheet big time. And then the big three are going to have a decision to make. All right, 2019, we made this decision. Now we're getting our asses handed to us. What do we do? Do we, gotta, do we have to, you know, walk back with our tail between our legs and acknowledge that was the dumbest thing ever and get back to some sanity? Or do you double down and say, oh, no, you guys are just a bunch of bigots, blah, 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 blah. Um, it, it, do we have any hope that that could happen? And I, I would love to, I would love to see it happen because then we could say, yeah, we, we told you so. You know, I mean, it's funny, like these guys are trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube. It's very, very difficult to do it though. You know, I mentioned that, um, you know, two years ago in 2020, 2021, BlackRock State Street Vanguard, they were voting for, you know, 40, 50% of these ESG proposals. You know, this last year they voted more for like 10 to 20% of them. Now that's still way too many. But like they can't credibly say that they were looking to maximize shareholder value two years ago when they were voting for 40 to 50 percent of these. And this year when they were voting for it now, only sudden like 10 to 20, like which one is it? You got to pick. And, you know, in the asset management industry, you usually need to have three year track records, four year track records. And it takes a long time to rebuild trust. And like, I don't think that these guys are going to rebuild a lot of trust anytime soon. And that's why we need to create a strive. Like, we're just authentic to what we do. We're here to maximize value and to prevent a lot of the problems that you mentioned about Gavin Newsom in California. You know, like if you're a, a pensioner in California right now, yeah, you're only getting 70% of the of the retirement that is promised to you, that the government has obligated to you. And you're only getting that because California has made boneheaded decisions over the last 10, 15 years. They were one of the first states that said, we're going to divest from the tobacco industry. They literally publicized. I mean, this was like idiotic. They said, we're getting out of selling all of our tobacco stocks. So, of course, what happened? You see, you're going to sell tobacco stocks. Tobacco stocks crater. So these guys, they literally sold like the absolute bottom when they said they're getting out of tobacco. And now, so they've missed out on billions of dollars of returns over the last couple of years when everyone else like bought these stocks like at the low. Gavin Newsom and like, you know, and, and, you know de Blasio in New York said the same thing. Like they're getting out of like fossil fuels. They're getting out of oil and gas, energy. Well, it's like, man, like, you know, in 2022, oil and gas like the best performing sector in the S&P 500. But they're like getting out of that sector now. I mean, it's just like crazy that they're not necessarily like, you know, looking out for the retirees. They're looking out for these like social agendas in their own political careers, which isn't what you're supposed to do when you're an asset manager. Yeah, and the, the Gavin Newsom one's funny because I think they uh, right after they announced that like all cars need to be electric in California by like what twenty thirty five, it was like I think a few days later they had to put out a mandate that do not charge your EVs because the power grid cannot support it. It's like, oh really? <laughs> That's ironic, <laughs> Gavin. Yeah. Like, oh my god. I mean, we could we could obviously go down a rabbit hole on that real quick. Yeah, I I, I just because it's so funny. I mean, it's not funny, but it is funny. The Southwest example. So you all remember yeah. the fiasco with Southwest where it, it was an absolute shit show that cancel like, you know, flights for what, a couple Flight. of weeks. And, uh, you know, I saw you finish the story. What happened with executive bonuses on that year that was an absolute dumpster fire for Southwest? How how'd the old executives do uh, when it came to that, that December uh, Christmas bonus? Yeah, it's wild. So the executives that said, again, just remember last Last year, the end of 2022, Southwest grounded like 16,000 flights. Nobody could get home. It was an absolute disaster. Yet all Southwest executives walked home with record bonuses that year. And why did they walk home with record bonuses? Well, because they had a lot of their compensation tied to ESG initiatives, environmental social government scores, which are like decreasing their emissions. You know how you decrease emissions? You ground 16,000 flights at the end of a year so you don't have airplanes flying all around. Also, they hit their diversity, equity, inclusion goals that year, which means that like they are hiring pilots based off their skin color, who they sleep with, you know, how they identify, whatever else. And they hit those requirements. Like, I don't know about you, Bear, but like, I just want a pilot that's going to safely get me from X to Y. I don't care what they look like, who they sleep with, whatever else. I just want a qualified pilot that's going to take me there. And that's what's crazy is that so like, you know, at the end of the year, they get paid all this money and uh, and even though like they didn't deliver what they're supposed to deliver on, which is just getting people from X to Y safely, comfortably. And that's what you're supposed to do as an airline. You know, the stock had a, it took a big hit at the end of the year. You know, all these guys walk out with like record home bonuses and compensation, which is, you know, shouldn't be the way that corporate America works. 
that's that's comical. You'd think that would be the year. Be like, all right, guys, we screwed up. Guess what? Bonuses are off this year. If you're an executive or above, you know, that's it. You know, and that, we got to figure it out next year. If we, we figure it out, you get bonuses again. But no, you, we're going to get, you know, smacked on the back of the head and not get bonuses. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Like, um, and it's, you know, it, it's one of those things. I think there's certain industries like, I don't think we should do any of these, like, quota-based hiring, hiring systems because, I, again, I think it's inherently, like, reverse. Like, it's it doesn't create unity, and I think people should be empowered to know that, they, hey, you can get the job on your own merit because I, I also, like, think if I was an African-American person and I was, you know, really working hard and, and, and getting after it, um, that would make me mad that, like, there's this thing in place that is implying that I'm not good enough to get it on my own merit or, or you know, someone who's homosexual or whatever else. Or like, I, you know, I'd be like, I don't need help. Like, I'm, I'm a good just as is as a person. You don't need to give me, you know, a, a, an unfair advantage because, like, you don't think I'm competent enough. Like, to me, so I look at it, compl- I flip the whole thing on its head. And I'm like, I, I, you know, maybe I'm an outlier here. But when I look at it, I'm like, the, the, it's actual, it is actual racism and sexism by what they're doing. So but what I was getting at is I think there should be certain industries where, like, this is a really dangerous thing. I mean, how about, like, you know, medical school? Right. Um, like in like people that become doctors, you know, or like what if you're it's a surgeon. Right. And there was some like DEI thing, you know, and again, that's not to say any of those people wouldn't be qualified. But like, you know, like let's make sure the person doing a brain surgery is the most qualified individual, the person driving an airplane. I mean, I feel like there's certain things that would be critical. And it's like, all right, if you're a marketing agency, like, all right, fine, go do your thing. I don't really care. But for the like, you know, same thing with our military. You know, I, you know, I was in the SEAL teams, man. And it's like the great thing about that. Guess what? They didn't give a shit um, because that's that's the that's a real job. And there are real implications if someone isn't proficient in the job. Right. So guess what? The best dudes who make it through are going to get it. And even with that, you got these admirals that are trying to be like, oh, we need more diversity in that community. It's like, hey, man, this is a complete merit based system. The only dudes that make it are hard dudes that really want to do the job that are also showed proficiency in what they were tested on. Right. This is not the time to put some guy in a platoon that, that just because he checked the box. Right. But it's even creeping into our military. Right. And it's like, this is insane. That, that, that should be a no fly zone. If you're doing a brain surgery or you're, you know, asked to freaking carry a rifle on behalf of your country and potentially, you know, get into a gunfight, we should not be worried about skin color or gender, even with, you know, women in the, in the teams, they're trying to get women in. And it's like, okay, if you can hack it, make it, but we're not going to force you through because now you become a liability if it doesn't, you know what I mean? So I could go down a rabbit hole on that, but, but I, I think there are real dangers, real dangers by making this a requirement in certain sectors. Right. 100% bear. And the other thing is like, like excellent people. Like if you were going to join the SEAL team, but you saw, see the SEAL team lowering their standards, then great people don't want to show up anymore. Like great people, they want to work with great people. And they know when there's like, you know, great people that are getting recruited and put through. And they also realize that when people who haven't earned it are being put through as well. And then that's, frankly, it's uh, it's wrong for both sides. It's wrong for the people that have earned it, who've earned it through merit. And it's wrong for the people that are getting an artificial kind of hand up as well. So couldn't agree more. Well, I know you have a hard stop, Anson, but I really appreciate you taking the time. I mean, I, I think we could honestly, we might have to do part two on this if you're open to it. No, I feel no, like there's it. because I think, about, so. you know, just to close it out from my side, I think, you know, without being able to go deeper on some of our, our reasons for being against this, there could be a lot of counter arguments of, oh, well, you know, that needs to be, that needs to happen because, you know, climate change is real. So like if the government's not going to do it, these corporations have to do it. So kudos to you or, Hey, if the, you know, people, you know, of minorities and aren't going to be represented in the workforce, then, you know, you should like, you know what I mean? Blah, 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 blah. And, and like, so we could, it, that needs to be unpacked in a much longer forum because on the surface, it's, it's very easy to come at us with these like counter arguments and, and, you know, at the surface level that they are valid because, and I see where they're coming from. Um, but of course, you know, we, we have a hard stop, so we can't get into that, but, um, you know, I, I guess Anson, Tony, I'll give you another say, and then Anson, you got the final word, man. You got yeah, anything else? Thank you for your time. I think th- these conversations need to take place more often. So I appreciate you hopping on with your direct experience. It's, it's cool to hear from somebody who was, who was a part of kind of the rollout and then you just being so knowledgeable with the industry you're in. So yeah, just thank you for your time. No guys. Hey man, thanks for having me on bear. This is great. No, let's do part two. There's a lot more to unpack here. And, uh, you know, man, I, uh, Huge supporter of the uh, of the military. Appreciate all you've done the SEALs. And, you know, if we take more of the SEAL mentality to corporate America, man, I have no doubt that we'll get this economy firing back in uh, in no time. Heck yeah. And and so just to, to kind of close out the, and this I think is my most proud plug I've ever done. 
Um, we don't have advertising here. We, so we just do it. But so strive asset management. So if, if right now someone's listening and they say, all right, this is bullshit. I want to take my money out of Vanguard or any of these other big ones. Can they go to what's the website? And I mean, assuming it's pretty straightforward on how to do that. I mean, I'm yeah, literally going to do that it's today. Literally, it's it's strive.com. Even better as well. We just launched a 401k program as well for like small, medium sized businesses. Okay. Where you can just move your employees 401ks over to strive as well. It's called a, it's called a, it's known as a PEP. It's a pooled employment plan. So it allows like a lot of small and medium sized businesses to actually pull their 401ks and give options now where you can have strive funds as part of the 401k. So you're not giving it to BlackRock. You're not giving it to Vanguard. You're not giving it to State Street. So you get the exact same funds, exact same performance, exact same fees, but you know that you're just there, you're, you're getting somebody who's maximizing your returns and not necessarily advancing a progressive agenda that's contrary to your own beliefs. Love it. And we have a 401k at Born Primitive here. So I'm going to get with HR right after this and we will make that an option for our employees because I think that's important too. Uh, well, well, cool. Well, Anson, thank you so much, man. Uh, you have an ally with us over here at Born Primitive. Thanks for what you're doing. Thanks for providing an awesome alternative um, for people. I mean, because I think that's the most critical part to all of this. So, so you brilliant move for what you're doing, um, and, and being a kind of a pioneer in this. And hopefully we can all get back to some sanity. Hopefully we can all come together and realize, um, you know, a lot of the things that we're fighting over are being pushed by uh, much hot, you know, entities much higher than us. And I think that's the goal for me ultimately is we, we all just need to realize we're all getting played. Um, I, I think, you know, Tony, my my take on this in our generation of people is we don't care about these things as much as they're trying to say we are you know what i mean and we don't care about sexual orientation we don't care about race we don't care about this and that um work hard be a good person um you know be a wagon puller right like we talked about um and uh and good things are going to happen um but it's just it's it's so frustrating as a proud american to see the, the division in our country because I genuinely believe it's being created by people that have ulterior interests. Um, and, it, and it's just a big, we're all getting gaslit, man. So uh, hopefully little by little, we can uh, get back to, to normal and, uh, you know, respect each other for, for, for how, you know, for, for the merits of what we're doing and um, none of those other external reasons that really aren't important at all. Uh, to, to I, think, I think there's some people on the fringe that might look at those things, but I think for the most part, people are just good everyday Americans that, uh, that don't subscribe to that. So, uh, all right. Well, I'm going long on this, but, but Anson, thanks again, man. Um, and, uh, stay in touch, buddy. Cool. Thank you guys. Appreciate thanks, it. Anson. All right. Later.